chapter 21 in the news. Either we have the wrong loose board, someone got the treasure already, or Miss Amanda is forgetting an important detail. Considering what I know now about ghosts, I think the last thing is pretty likely. Luckily, Roger assumed my dirty clothes were from being out in the clearing after a rainstorm, which is partly true. He didn't want to talk about Miss Amanda when we got back to the old county bank. Maybe he had his fill of talking after dinner with Elise. The only thing he said to me about it was, Just keep this between me and you. She's the reason we have each other, but it's really no one else's business. Now that Roger is asleep upstairs and I think about the look in his eyes when I mentioned Miss Amanda, I realize he may have known her non-ghost version. If she died the night of the tornado and she worked at the zoo, they should have known each other. Maybe he's sad she died. Maybe that's why he doesn't want to talk about it. When I was little, I asked Roger what he thought happened to my parents if they died. He didn't seem to want to talk about that either, but he wrapped his strong arms around me and said they probably went to live in the sky right over the zoo where they could watch over me all the time. It made me feel even more that the zoo was a safe place. The clock in the old county bank ticks a rhythm that echoes through the main floor. I sit at the desk with a computer screen and my newspaper article in front of me. I've read the article so many times I have it nearly memorized. Category 5 tornado destroys farmland, Haven Hills, and Lexington neighborhoods. Leaves many without homes. Eight reported deaths. June 9, 2013. On Saturday, June 8, the dark skies above eastern Nebraska brewed a particularly rare kind of storm, the kind that hasn't hit the state since 1964. A supercell thunderstorm first appeared over farmland 30 miles northwest of Lexington. It grew to an EF5 level funnel cloud on the I-5 enhanced Fujita scale and destroyed the small farming community of Haven Hills. The twister traveled 10 more miles and crossed the Lexington city limits behind Lillian Park at approximately 10.15 p.m., with winds estimated to have exceeded 220 miles per hour. The section of the city between Lexington Way and Telegraph Road was completely destroyed, with no structures remaining and much of the debris launched like missiles into other parts of the city. Only a few minutes after entering the city, the tornado dissipated one mile south of the Lexington Zoo. The zoo sustained damage to the fences and structures. However, the zoo has reported that they've had no losses among the animals. As emergency response teams joined the citizens of Haven Hills and Lexington in relief efforts, eight people have been found dead. Many have been left injured and homeless, and dozens have been reported missing. An unidentified young girl was found after the storm inside the elephant enclosure at the Lexington Zoo. She was alone and dirty, but otherwise unharmed. Authorities are making every effort to locate her family. If you know of any possible leads, please contact the Lexington Police Department or Child Welfare Services. I scan the article and my eyes hover over the words, eight people have been found dead. Was Miss Amanda among those eight? I type in a search window, Amanda Holtz, and I get 3,472 results. I add the words, Lexington Zoo. The top of the results screen shows a row of images. Some of the pictures are of the Lexington Zoo, the advertising images Mrs. Lee posts online. Some show the gift shop with the bronze lion pride statue. Some show the African grasslands grand opening, and others advertise educational programs at the Wild Kingdom Education Center. I scroll through the images, past all the zoo pictures, until I find people in the pictures. Two pictures catch my eye. One is of a very thin, very elegant-looking woman shaking hands with what looks like a younger, less round Frank Bixley. The woman is in high heels, unusual for the zoo, and she's wearing a red dress with a navy belt around her waist. She looks like she should be on the entertainment news, except she's wearing one of the old Lexington Zoo uniform hats, the wide-brimmed safari style. And it's Miss Amanda Holtz. I'm sure of it. The second picture is even more striking. It's a close-up of her face in black and white. She's younger looking than the ghost I saw in the woods, with less wrinkles around the eyes and fuller lips. She's absolutely beautiful. 
I click on the photo and it takes me to a website about the Fen Circus, a North American traveling circus that has gone out of business. I know something about the Fen Circus. It's written on the plaques below the photographs on the elephant barn walls. Naya and her mother Tendai came from the Fen Circus. I scroll down the page and I find the photograph of Amanda Holtz, finance manager for Angus Fenn. According to the website, Miss Amanda had worked for the circus for almost 30 years. I return to my search results and click on the first photograph of Miss Amanda, the one with the younger Frank Bixley in front of the zoo gift shop. The photo links to a newspaper article printed by the Lexington Herald. Lexington Zoo welcomes new retail manager, September 24, 2009. Just after completing a successful protocol inspection with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, AZA, the Lexington Zoo has acquired a new face. Amanda Holtz, experienced finance manager for the Fen Circus, says she's ready for a change from life on the road and has consented to join the ranks of Lexington Zoo employees. Ms. Holtz will oversee the zoo's retail operations and assist in fundraising efforts. Frank Bixley, Lexington Zoo General Manager, says the zoo is still searching for the right candidate to train with Joe Treadwell, head zookeeper, with the aim of taking Treadwell's post when he retires. In smaller letters, the caption below the photograph says, Frank Bixley, General Manager, with new retail manager Amanda Holtz in front of the Lexington Zoo gift shop. So Miss Amanda did work for the zoo. She knew Mr. Bixley. She worked here before I came to the zoo, before Fisher's dad got the head keeper job, and before that she worked at the very same circus that Maya, excuse me, Naya and her mother came from. The wind picks up suddenly, something it does often late at night, and it rattles the windows of the old county bank and clanks the metal cover over the chimney. I don't hear its words unless it's blowing in my ears, but suddenly I'm not interested in what it has to say. I have enough to think about for now. I save the websites about Amanda Holtz in my favorites tab and shut down the computer. Roger dislikes the whirring sound it makes when we leave it on. He says technology makes the whole house hum with an unnatural buzz. I switch off the downstairs lights and take the, my newspaper article upstairs to my bedroom. It's a tiny room, barely large enough for the bed, a smallish dresser, a nightstand, and a lamp. But Roger and I hung a mirror on one wall and a map of the world on another, and both are enough to make the room just right for me. Roger said that every time I look into the mirror and see my blue eyes looking back at me, I can remember that I'll always have a piece of my family with me. He said that when I wonder where I came from and what my parents were like, I can look at my face my rounded nose, my crazy curly hair, and know a little something about them. I must resemble them in some way. I wonder if I do the things they did, like how some people crack their knuckles and some people always drink the milk left in the bowl from their breakfast cereal. I don't know if I'm left-handed because my dad was or if I chew on my lip when I'm concentrating because my mom did that. I like to think so. The map of the world on my other wall is covered with stickers Roger and I use to identify the original homes of the various animal species we have at the zoo. Stickers on the African continent say sand boa over Kenya and elephant over Tanzania and Swaziland. I don't know where my sticker should go since no one found evidence of a family for me in Lexington or in Nebraska at all. I've laid out the collection of junk I found from beneath the gift shop floorboard. I flop down on the bed and pick up the old crinkled train ticket. The zoo train tickets aren't small like carnival tickets. They're more like a, the size of a skinny postcard. It doesn't seem possible that this ticket slid into the space below the floor. Besides being fairly wrinkled, the ticket's edges curl up like it was once rolled into a tight cylinder, like maybe someone rolled it up and pushed it through the half-moon knothole. I smooth the ticket as best I can, feeling sorry that I didn't find something valuable under the board. Sorry I didn't find Miss Amanda's treasure. And as I unfold the creased corner on the ticket, I notice something that I didn't before. I'm not sure what it means, if anything, but it's too weird not to mean something. The ticket was printed on June 8, 2013, the day of the tornado.
Chapter 22. Caught. The next morning, no one answers at the Lee's house. Fisher couldn't have forgotten about elephant training, but maybe his chores took him longer than usual. I head to the maintenance shed at the African grasslands and knock on the door. Thomas doesn't come, so I knock again, a little louder this time. Thomas finally opens the door, his hat on backwards. He takes one glance at me and asks, Where's Fisher? I can't find Fisher this morning, but I was hoping that you might let me help with training anyway. I give Thomas a pleading look that shows that I know the rules, but I'm asking him to overlook this small detail. Mr. Lee said Fisher and I could help with the elephants if we went together, but I don't know where Fisher is, and I really need to see Naya. Thomas thinks for a minute. He rubs his hand over his mouth and chin like he's working out long division, and he sighs. Well, I know elephants well enough to see that Naya has a connection with you, he says, and he glances over my shoulder toward the veterinary head headquarters in Mr. Lee's office. His muscled arm holds the metal door open all the way, and he waves me inside. Keep it quiet, okay? Thanks, Thomas, I said. Naya is waiting several feet from the training gate, her trunk bobbing and twisting in the air as though she's searching for something invisible to grab. Her big feet look too soft to support something so large. She lets her ankle joint relax as she lifts her front foot, and it looks almost too flimsy to hold her, but then she steps on it and the baggy skin stretches as the foot spreads under her weight. There's a reason Thomas invites them to have their feet inspected every day. Their feet must stay healthy. Now she was here at sunrise, Thomas says, a hint of a question in his voice as he unwinds the hose from its tether. He knows that something is going on. Well, she must have really liked her training session yesterday, I say, picking up two target poles from the rack. Or something like that, Thomas carries a pile of foot care tools to the training area. I've been working with elephants a long time, you know, and I've observed them in the wild and in captivity. Sometimes, if you pay attention around elephants, you can notice a pulsing feeling, as though the air is thumping against your head. Have you noticed something like that? I've noticed that, I say eagerly. It's like a rumbling with no sound. Thomas smiles and nods. You noticed it in here yesterday, didn't you? Yes, I say, wondering what else Thomas knows. Thomas joins me at the barrier fence and watches Naya with a calmness in his eyes that tells me that Thomas is one of those special people that elephants can trust. Naya walks toward him with her tail swishing from side to side. Researchers have recorded the sounds of elephants for long periods of time, he continues, his eyes still on Naya, and they've taken those recordings and sped them up. At a higher frequency, we can hear the elephants speak to each other with sounds that we couldn't hear before. Isn't that amazing? Yes, I say softly, wondering what Thomas would think if I told him that I could see images from those rumblings. But then Naya takes a few steps closer, and I feel the thumping of invisible sound waves just like Thomas described it. Except the thumping and rumbling come through the earth as well. Naya bobs her head lower, and I look into her beautiful eyes. Images flood my mind like those pictures that change as you move them in the light. Elephants. A large circus arena. The elephants are now in a line rearing up on their hind legs, following the arm motions of a trainer. Crowds of people. A circus man with a brown beard and a long coat in the center of it all. A blonde woman in overalls leading the elephants away from the show and the crowds. They follow her without ropes or prodding. They walk together like friends. And just as I knew Naya's urgent feeling about the woods, I feel an emotion with this image, too. She misses them, the elephants and the blonde woman. I went to the trees, Naya. I think the words, the way I talked to the wind. I found Amanda Holtz. I, I found a train ticket from the day of the tornado. I don't know what that means. Naya grabs a clump of dirt with the two fingers on the end of her trunk and tosses the dirt in a cloud of dust over her massive shoulders, something that she does to protect her skin from insects in the sun. She sways a little, bobbing her head and swinging her trunk from left to right. 
It looks like she's dancing to the rhythmic African music playing from the grassland speakers, or else she understands me. But this is actually a rocking habit she developed because there wasn't enough space for her to roam at the circus. I've heard Mr. Lee talk about the behavior and how, about how elephants have to move. He says her swaying has lessened since coming to the zoo because now she has more space. I try to think the way Naya does, in pictures. I think hard about the woods, about Miss Amanda and her trailer in the trees, about the gift shop and what I found there. And I focus on Naya and the scenes in my mind, hoping that somehow she will know what I want to tell her. Naya stops bobbing and swinging her trunk. Another slow, calm rumble comes through the earth and the air and into me. And I see another image. Three elephants standing together with trainers beside them. And since I see this through Naya's eyes, Naya makes four, elephants with circus adornments on their heads and backs. One of them looks like Tendai. But Naya's mother has died, so that leaves Naya plus two. These pictures in my head come with feelings so familiar that they might as well be my own. Naya wants me to find her family. Lex, Thomas says, breaking the silence. I realize he's been leaning against the barrier fence, watching me and Naya. I completely forgot that Naya and I weren't alone. I blink, feeling a little like I just woke up, like I can't remember how I got into the elephant barn for a few seconds, and then my brain defrosts, and Thomas is waving at me with a frantic expression. Frank and Gordon are coming, Thomas says. He means Mr. Bixley and Mr. Lee. You've got to go. You're not supposed to be here, so go out the side door. He points around the corner from the supply shelf and walks that direction with me a few paces. That was interesting to watch, he says quickly under his breath, and I've seen a lot of things and a lot of elephants. Please come back tomorrow and explain to me what's really going on with you and Naya. I'd really like to know. I nod and I head out the side door before Mr. Bixley and Mr. Lee find me breaking the rule about elephant training. I wouldn't want Thomas to get in trouble or lose his job because of me. He's very good with the elephants, especially Naya. The side door puts me out onto a smaller walkway, one of the many that lead to the Wild Kingdom Education Center. I make sure the door latches completely, and then I spin around and I run right into Roger. Whoa there, Roger says. He's usually preparing the steam train in the morning before the zoo opens. Roger, what... I've been talking with Mr. Bixley, Roger says, and he looks really uncomfortable. Not angry, but not happy either. I know where this is going, even though I hope it's nothing. But it's not nothing for Roger to leave the train 30 minutes before the zoo opens. It's not nothing for him to be waiting at the barn doors to catch me coming out of them. Lexington, did you know Frank Bixley installed security cameras in the gift shop? My heartbeat is like a hummingbird in my chest. I stare at him, waiting to find out what else he knows. Roger rests his hands on his waist like he can't decide whether to fold his arms or what. Did you know the alarms went off at the gift shop last night and Frank watched those security tapes? The air feels heavy and prickly. Too bad, whispers the wind. I think of how I tried to cover up what Fisher and I did in the gift shop by calling Roger on the radio like we'd been in the treehouse all along. Like a lie. A lie in the treehouse that Roger built for me. He knows what you and Fisher did in the gift shop last night. Roger never frowns at me like this, and he never fidgets, folding his arms, unfolding them, putting his hands back at his waist like he doesn't know what to do. I don't like it. I want Roger and me to go back to normal. I've decided that you'll help Isabel do chores in the gift shop until she says you've worked enough to make up for the damage. That's okay. I like Isabel. And I did damage the gift shop floor. I can do chores for Isabel. And Mr. Bixley has decided that no employees' kids are allowed inside the maintenance buildings. He stuffs his hands into the pockets of his overalls including the elephant barn. What? Because of the gift shop floor? The words are launched from my mouth like rockets and they keep coming. 
That doesn't have anything to do with Naya. I haven't done anything to the elephant barn or to Naya. And when he says employees, kids, he really just means Fisher and me. Why is Mr. Bixley so... Shh. Roger husses, hushes me with unaffected calm. Shh. We both know how Mr. Bixley can be. He wants to show you he's in charge and that he's serious about the zoo. The zoo is, well, I guess it's like his property. And that's the way he thinks of it anyway. And anything like what you and Fisher did, he takes personally. The cicadas rev up their vibrating buzz in the trees, and that sound makes me feel itchy and angry. Hot tears burn the corner of my eyes. Mr. Bixley's precious gift shop floor is nothing compared to my friendship with Naya. It's not fair for him to keep me from visiting her. I think of Naya coming to the training gates to look for me, and I won't be there. The, the Lees are, and I are paying to have the floor repaired, and we think you and Fisher can work off the cost of the damage. You working with Isabel and Fisher with his dad. I'll talk to Mr. Bixley in a few days when he has when he has had a chance to cool off. Okay, I say quietly. You'll talk to him? Yes. Roger puts an arm around my shoulders and it holds me together. I'm suddenly very sorry for Fisher. I hope Mr. Lee will let me help him with his chores. Lexington, I just want you to tell me one thing. Yes? What in the world set that idea in motion? Roger's deep voice stays smooth and steady, but he still sounds very serious. And why on earth would you break into the gift shop and do that to the floor? This just got tricky. I don't lie to Roger. I've never had a reason to. But if I tell him that the ghost of Amanda Holt started all of this, or that it was Naya who sent me into the woods in the first place, I'm risking a whole lot here. What if Roger tells me I can't go see Miss Amanda either? I can't lose Naya and Miss Amanda all at once, and Miss Amanda may know something about Naya's family. So I take a page from Fisher's book, and I tell Roger just enough of something true. Fisher and I knew that floorboard had been loose for a long time, and we thought it might be a place where people had been hiding things. A tiny smile starts to build at the corner of Roger's mouth. Buried treasure, huh? He sounds amused. Yeah. Well, did you find anything good? Not really, just a bunch of stuff that would fall through a crack. I pulled the ticket out of my pocket. Except for this. Look at the date. Roger takes the ticket and turns it over in his hands. He finds the date and stares at it for longer than it takes to read it. You found this beneath the floorboard, huh? Yeah, it was for the day that... And I don't need to finish because Roger knows what day it was. He takes a deep breath and hands the ticket back to me. That's a weird coincidence, he says, raising his eyebrows. He pats me on the shoulder and points out a monarch butterfly about to land on the purple flowers of a butterfly bush. We watch it flit about until it chooses one. I want you to start helping Isabel this morning and meet me for lunch at noon. And take the radio with you, Roger says when the monarch flies away. Do you have it? I unhook the cumbersome thing from the waistband of my shorts. Right here, fully charged. Good. Roger turns and starts toward the main path. His engine needs attention or it won't be ready for the first run of the day. It takes more than one skilled person to get a steam train going, and I'm guessing Roger has left J.P. Felt alone at the station. As we part ways, with me going uphill to the gift shop and Roger going downhill, he says, No more destroying zoo property looking for buried treasure. And from the look in his eyes, I think Roger knows there is more going on here than what I've told him.